Good morning and welcome to our continuing series of new adventures, that is, new adventures in God. And as we approach this series, we need to recognize that God does have a new adventure for every one of us individually and for us as a community. Individually, we can press on into all that God has got for us, regardless of age, regardless of social standing, regardless of educational achievement, God has a new adventure for each and every one of us. And in these new adventures, God, our loving Heavenly Father, wants what is best for us. He is for us. He is with us. And he is with us to bless us. Now, when we look at the death and resurrection of Jesus, we see that God gave his very best for us. And he has never stopped giving of his best. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is a generous God. Ephesians 1, 7 to 9 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches, the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. God gives super abundantly. He pours out of his generous heart his grace upon us. So God was, is, and always will be for his people. So when he tells his people, when he commands his people to, to do something, it is ultimately for their benefit. And as we look at this whole theme of new adventures, we need to look at the children of Israel as they were called to a new adventure in God as they were delivered from slavery in Egypt and journeyed towards the promised land. This was the most incredible adventure for the people of God and one which has uh, played such a huge part in the history of the people of God. God gave a very clear command to his people as they prepared to cross into the promised land. For in this land, there were places known as high places, where all manner of evil things took place. There were places where foreign gods were worshipped. There were places where detestable practices were carried out, where the abomination of child sacrifice took place. And these were there on the high places, the hilltops, the mountain tops of the promised land. And God had a very clear word to his people as they prepared to enter into and to possess the land. Numbers 33, 51 says, speak to the Israelites. So here is God speaking to Moses. Speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you cross the Jordan into Canaan, drive out all of the inhabitants of the land before you, Destroy their carved images and their cast idols and demolish all of their high places. Take possession of the land and settle in it for I have given you the land to possess. This is repeated in Deuteronomy 12. These are the decrees and laws you must be careful to follow in the land that the Lord the God of your ancestors has given you to possess. Destroy completely all the, all the places on the high mountains, on the hills and under every spreading tree where the nations you are dispossessing worship their gods. It goes on to say, break down their altars. And so the word of God was quite clear. The word of God included that promise of God. I have given you the land to possess. God does not call us to something that we can never fulfill. He doesn't hold it out there like a carriage just driving us on without any possibility of realizing the promise. 
He does not make empty promises. And when God promises something to us, he equips us for the task. But as we read on the story of the Israelites, we will see that although God had given clear instruction about destroying the high places, destroying the places of evil, they didn't. The people of Israel did not remove the high places. Those places remained there for a snare to the people of God for hundreds of years. And it's only during the reign of King Hezekiah that they were finally removed. And in not removing the high places in accordance with the word of the Lord, the people of Israel, in effect, settled for second best. They compromised on the call of God upon them. And this is incredible. When we consider all that God had done, the miracles he had worked on behalf of his people in order to bring them into that place of freedom from slavery, the miracles he was going to work and promised to work as they entered into the promised land. I have given you this land to possess, he said. So what all they needed was available in order to fulfill the command of God. So why is it the children of Israel allowed the high places to remain? Well, I believe it, the answer is fairly simple. It was the way of least resistance. It was the easy way. There was no great desire. They were very happy to settle for what they had. What they had was good in the promised land, but it wasn't the fullness of what God wanted for them. And the existence, the continued existence of high places in the land of promise represented a compromise on the part of the people of God. You see, taking the high places would have meant more battles. It would have meant more effort. So why bother? We've possessed the majority of the land. Let's just settle for that. Let's take the easy way out. And that's exactly what the people of God did for hundreds of years. They lacked the will, the determination to pursue all that God had for them. They compromised. They accepted standards that were lower than God's best. Now, when we come to consider how this applies to us, when we start to talk about uncompromising Christians, I think the society in which we live has a very clear picture of what Christians look like when they are in that place of not compromising. They think of religious, legalistic, narrow-minded bigots who give themselves to judging and condemning others. That's the view the media have of those Christians who will not compromise. But that is not the view I want us to take here. I don't want us to think that we're spending our time judging others. We need to look at ourselves and we need to recognize where we have compromised in our pursuit of the things of God and have that uncompromising approach to all that he's called us to do. And I want us to look here and view this in the light of Emmanuel Church and what God has called us to in Emmanuel Church. And as we allow these things to sink into our hearts and spirits, to give ourselves to that uncompromising pursuit of what God has said to us, what God has promised to us, and as he has promised, as we pursue these promises, God will be faithful and we will see them come about in increasing measure. So Jesus has spoken to us as a community that we are to be a church of increase. We are to be a church of the spirit. We are to be a church that is family. We are to be a church gathered from the nations for the nations. In other words, to be a growing, charismatic family church with a world vision. Growing, charismatic, 
family world. These are the four pillars of Emmanuel, built upon the foundation of Jesus himself, who holds the whole church together. He is the foundation of all that we are doing. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, No one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And as a community of faith, we have to follow what Jesus, the head of the church, has called us to be. For Ephesians 1 says, God has placed all things under his feet, appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. He is the head of the body. He is the head of the church. And as Jesus calls us onwards, as he calls us into new adventures with him, we have to recognize that we need to refuse to settle for what we have. Unlike the children of Israel who settled for what they had and they missed out on the best that God had for them, we need to reject that approach and say deep within our hearts, we're going to press on and press in to all that God has got for us. You know, the lack of desire to press on in God will kill a church. We do not want to be a church that look back, looks back on the days of glory and say, oh, if only. We need to press on. We need to deny apathy a place in our thinking. And so as we look at these four pillars of Emmanuel Church, as we look upon growth, being charismatic, being a family, and having that world vision. There is one of these above all else which is under threat. And pressures come in from many different directions to compromise on this particular element of our calling in God. And that is the whole issue of what it is to be charismatic. So being charismatic for us is not about singing lively songs that were written in the last few years. It's not about having the ability or being encouraged to raise our hands and worship. It's not even about dancing in worship. Being charismatic is about pursuing the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and allowing him to have free reign within us. We believe that every Christian needs to experience being filled with the Spirit, being baptized in the Spirit, in the fulfillment of the prophecy of John the Baptist as he prophesied, I baptize in water, but one is coming who will baptize in the Holy Spirit. And if we wish to be a New Testament church, we need to have a New Testament experience with signs accompanying that infilling. And as we look at the New Testament, we find that very often the sign that accompanied being filled and baptized in the Spirit was speaking in tongues. Churches such as Emmanuel were established as the result of people coming into this new experience of the Holy Spirit, having new adventures in God and establishing new churches back into the 70s and 80s. And the book of Acts gives us a blueprint of what we should be seeking to build with every follower of Jesus having an empowering experience of the Holy Spirit. And Acts 8, verses 14 to 19, gives us a wonderful picture of what we should be pressing into God for here in Emmanuel. Let me read Acts 8, verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, 
They prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when we look at this passage, the first thing we need to recognize is that these were believers in Jesus. They were Christians. It says, when Peter and John arrived, they, might, they prayed that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not been given. They had simply been baptized into the name of Jesus. So they had given themselves in baptism, but there was something had not happened. They had not received the Holy Spirit. Now the first question is, how did they know they had not received the Holy Spirit? And then, how did they know they had received the Holy Spirit? It doesn't give us a lot of detail. But what we can be sure of is that what happened when they received the Holy Spirit could be witnessed by others watching. Because Simon in verse 18 says, when he saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of hands, he said, I want the ability to do this. I'm going to pay you that you give me the ability to do this. He's a witness. His motives are all mixed up and all wrong. But he could see something had happened. They were Christians. They had been baptized in the Spirit. But then they needed to be immersed, overwhelmed, filled, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so they were. And this is very much part and parcel of the life of the early church. And it needs to be part of our life too. You see, this lifts the life of the church beyond singing lively modern songs into a whole new realm of moving in the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so to be a charismatic church, we need to have individuals who have been baptized in the Spirit and become charismatic individuals eagerly desiring spiritual gifts as we are uh, commanded to do in 1 Corinthians 14. That we eagerly, earnestly hunger after spiritual gifts which Jesus loves to give us. We need that inward filling that has an outward overflow. We need to come to Jesus and ask him to fill us afresh. And this is all about Jesus. If we read in Acts chapter 1, Jesus commands the disciples to wait and he's going to send the Spirit as a fulfillment of the promise of the Father. We need to walk in the fullness of that filling. Jesus is ready to give. The question is, are we ready to receive? The children of Israel, they compromised. They settled for second best. We have that choice to make today. Are we going to compromise and settle for what we have? Or are we going to press on into all that Jesus has for us? through the empowering, the ongoing empowering of the Holy Spirit. Father, I just pray for every person listening and watching. I pray, Father, that in the stillness of their homes, they will know an infilling and an empowering of the Holy Spirit in a way they've never known before. We ask, Lord, that as we seek to be a New Testament church, we will have that New Testament experience of being overwhelmed by the Spirit of Jesus. And we give him all the praise and all the glory. Amen.